Gonna hurry Botswana 1000 Desert Race Round 4 of the APSA Off-Road Championship has always been a race that has stretched vehicles, crews, drivers and even the organizers to the limit and then way beyond. The Kalahari Desert is inhospitable and in the Botswana capital Gaborone, the organizers set up a route which traversed some of the most varied terrain that drivers, navigators and teams have encountered in many a year. Hello motorsport fans, I'm Arnold Gantz. And I'm Roald Woods. And for the cars to survive the 1,000 kilometer long track, drivers had to preserve, conserve and cajole their charges through some of the continent's harshest terrain. When the dust settled, literally, after the 96 kilometer long prologue, day two dawned with the Micker and XL dealer team of father and son Hücke and Jaap de Brain first off after they had for the second consecutive year set the fastest time in the production car battle. The ever-present fire engine red Nissan Navara of championship leader Duncan Foss and standing co-driver young Louis Weichelt had started off in fourth place but had steadily worked their way into strong contention. Toyota had a stranglehold at the top though and Chris Fisser and Yabi Bardenos in the first of the Castrol Toyotas were right up there in the thick of things. In only their second race outing together, track racer Anthony Taylor and Robin Houghton astounded by bringing home their white, red and green Hilux in sixth place after the day's 500k outing after being in the top three for a while. With former champions Neil Woolridge and Kenny Schultomer, the first four after battling a few punctures in an ideal position. Alfie Cox, who loved the conditions, tough, dusty and exhausting, reveled in the motorite SP and was split 12 minutes back. But the driver of the day belonged to Mark Cronier and his level-headed navigator Chris Birkin. They went from 12th to 1st in an amazingly patient display. With Hannes Krobler and Jean Moore in the second, Nissan back into the top 10, having to scramble after a 30-minute repair stop attending to an accelerator mechanism spring. George and Sharon Barkhuizen were their usual cautious, consistent selves. And after starting off in 45th place overall, ate a lot of dirt on the way to 8th in the SB class overnight. For the IDM cement team of Yaku Swanepoel and Keith Solomon, there was a very solid showing in ninth. But even the man in the moon would have been exhausted watching this stuff, as the brothers of Matten, that's Henry and Maurice, led Class D by four minutes. With Corvus van Tonda and Rian Guapa and the next Ford Ranger rounding out the top ten in the SP class. Second in Class D, it was championship log leaders Kutsia Labuskakni and Johan Kerba in their race on Nissan Hardbody setting up a great battle for the final day. And in Class E in the production class, champions Jack Beckham and Lucio Santoro set the pace, but they only had three minutes of leeway. Over this crew, Team Barber Spun's Yanni Fisser and Jox Leroux, who are biding their time and racing intelligently. Chris Deploy and Henk Janse van Furen were also in with a shout in Class D. While well, Gebot from Breda and Johan de Toy rounded out the top three in Class E. But it was a long day at the office. Ramon and Moret Bezaydeno from Delmas had staked their claim in Class D after almost nine hours for day two. But it was a great day for Toyota. Five of their charges in the top ten. And a slender lead of just 17 seconds for Mark Renier and Chris Berker, with the four just one minute and 47 seconds further back. In the special vehicle class, the racing was as furious if not quite so fast. Nardis Alberts and Jeff Minnett in the big wraps are back with its 6-litre Chev engine set the pace after prologue when Evan Hutchison broke a drive shaft. The dust took its toll though, but no one told Colin Matthews and Alan Smith that. They were superb and ended fourth after the day's racing. In 2006 winner Nick Hopper and standing co-driver Andrew Chalupski ended up three minutes behind in second as they whittled away at the Kalahari Desert. And the championship log leaders Cully and Quinton Silvold were hoping to celebrate Father's Day with a second consecutive win in the sand and they took fifth. Regent Racing's team were smiling from ear to ear as they Michael Whitehouse and Matthew Carlson steamed into a very credible sixth 13 minutes behind. 
with Shamir Variawa and Siegfried Rousseau in the total motorsport quarter, taking that 7-litre engine to a fine second place, up seven places. 2005 national champ Terence Marsh, together with Peter Krunovot in the second region racing bat, were well set for an assault on day three. With the leaders in Class P, Ruakon sibling team David and Gary White in their bat, who were laying it on big time. And in the B class, Ruakon provided second place. Lo De Brain and Rudy Britz were chasing hard. As these two men, Bez Bezadenote and Johan De Brain, went to sleep on an overnight lead of just 47 seconds. But with a whole 400 kilometers of racing ahead on the third and final day, it was Alberts and Minnit who were 5 minutes and 19 seconds ahead of Team Total Motorsport in the special vehicle class. The night was spent repairing, checking and ensuring that the cars would be up to the pounding of the last day, which would send the drivers out to Buerta Paclu. From there, the route would snake towards Nguari, Marutswane, and then north to the designated service point after 200 k's. After a 15-minute compulsory stop, a rough stretch to Kumakwani awaited the teams on the way to the finish at Game City in Gaborone. For the friends, there was heartbreak again, almost a carbon copy of 2007, unfortunately. Uh, very disappointing day. Um, we started very, um, off very good this morning. Having a good clean run till about 200 k's into the race. And uh, yeah, we hit a tree with a sharp left turn and uh, the bucket just slides to the right. Unfortunately, my side and we hit the tree. We take off, uh, out the rear axle with the rear side shaft, everything. Broke two shocks. So that was it for us. Um, but, uh, as I said, we are disappointed, but that's off-road racing. And it's all, every time there's something new that can happen to you, I we just wish my luck can turn, and hopefully the next time. Hey, long day at the office, eh? It, uh, I thought it was never going to end. I must say, those last 70 k just went on and on and on. But uh, yeah, we had a good day. We had another puncher early this morning, which uh, unfortunately, we didn't lose a lot of time, but with fixing a puncher, you lose some, you lose positions, and the positions are the dust. And the dust was so bad today, so we, we battled a bit to get those positions back. But then we had a clean run. We had no problems with the car. We broke a shock absorber about 80 kilometers from the end of the end of the day, which slowed us down a bit. But then uh, the dust was so bad near the back, so near the end. So I don't think we lost too much time. But uh, yeah, we had a good day, long, hard day, like a real old desert race of the old days. Uh, the first 250 k's was really technical, lots of rocks and tight and twisty. And then the, the last 250 k's opened up quite nicely. There was, uh, we went along the cut lines for quite a while, so nice good high speed stuff, so a bit of everything. So uh, yeah, overall a good day. Tired now, gonna have a good night's sleep and uh, do it again tomorrow. Vehicle and asset finance from ABSA. Going the extra mile to get you from ABSA. Going off the beaten track to find solutions. The 2008 Toyota Kalahari Botswana 1000 Desert Race continues and the driver's briefing for day three just outside Gaborone, Botswana was tense early. Roll, the teams knew that it would be a hard day and they already had almost 600 k's of racing in Dem Bones. For Mark Grenier, the lead would mean only one thing, no dust. Well, I'm really happy to be out in front. Um, yesterday we had quite a, a lot of dust and uh, I think today you know, we're going to try and keep it neat and tidy and let the other guys work for a change. So that's the plan. Whether it pans out or not, we'll have to see, eh? The dice is certainly set up nicely. Foss, Woolridge, Taylor, they're all there, ready to bounce. Yeah, look, I think it's uh, it's going to be a tussle all year, you know, and at the end of the day, we've got to just take it one step at a time and just pick it off slowly but surely. And uh, I think uh, if we get it to the end, we'll be there. As for Foss, the pressure was there. They had to judge it just right on the day. Look, it's going to be another long day. Uh, we're going to try and not make mistakes, but also we're going to try and beat the Toyota in front of us. Uh, the pressure's on. We, we need to have a, have a good, clean, fast run.
Duncan, you're only 80 seconds ahead of the Ford. You'll have to watch Neil Woolridge carefully. Yeah, we've got a little bit of a gap on the Ford, but he's, uh, we're all within a couple of minutes of each other, and uh, he's going to be right there. So, yeah, we've got pressure from the front and from the back, from behind. Anthony Taylor and Robin Halpin had a great day at work, despite fatting twice and exercising some arm muscles. We had quite a good day. I was running very well in the, up in the front there, and then uh, we had a, two punches, which cost us a little bit of time. But then the last 100 k's of the top loop, uh, we lost power steering. So, you know, to drive that, that big truck with no power steering for 100 kilometers is pretty, pretty difficult. And uh, so there I lost another, I reckon, about 12, 15 minutes perhaps. So, I mean, on the whole, I was running strong. Um, I got radio contact with the team and they told me that I was catching Duncan at the time when the power steering failed on me. I was only three minutes behind. So, yeah. It was going very, very well. I'm glad that um, Mark's in the lead. Um, he must have driven a, like a bat out of hell, you know, to get where he is. But um, yeah, we'll keep the pressure on and let's hope for a brilliant result for Toyota. It was. In the specials, the gloves were off. Yeah, well, I'm uh, in a very comfortable uh, position. Got a bit of a dust gap behind a guy in front of me and then uh, the car following me is like five minutes behind, so... A nice position to be in, if we can do what we did yesterday and only get out of the refuel or the end, we should be doing, uh, we should be doing okay. Shamir Varayawa was in great form even though he and Siegfried Rousseau had their own troubles in the total porter. Yeah, look, uh, it's, it's five minutes between myself and Nardis and, um, well, yesterday considering we came from 23rd position, passing all those cars in the dust, the whole day we drove in dust, so I think that um, hampered the time a bit with... Uh, and then we had a tough pump blow up on us, so we uh, stopped for five minutes to see what we could do there. So I think our pace is right, and uh, we'll keep to the same pace today, like yesterday, and uh, hopefully we'll get up there. I mean, it's still another 500 k's, anything can happen, you know. But the guys uh, did a perfect job on the car, they worked the whole night, and uh, the car's fine. When all the talking was done, it was Cronier who was away with all the pressure of leading the longest of the eight-race ABSA off-road championship calendar. A tense final day lay ahead. And one of the men who would make a tense was Foss. He hit the road next. The defending national champ would rely heavily on his fitness and stamina on this long day. And Arnie, he and Weichelt were meshing into a better unit with each passing minute in the cockpit. In contrast, Woolridge and Schultham have been together for donkey's years and were more than able, ready and willing to apply the pressure. Then in the specials, it was Alberton Minute who never even had to get out of their car on day two. They were hoping for a replay. Cronier, reigning national rally champion with Birkin, had it going sideways in typical style and started off in a big hurry. Force driving right on the limit was pushing hard. He wanted to wipe out that small 17 second advantage quickly. And don't think for a second that Woolridge and Schulthammer were not following the same modus operandi. Albertson minutes streaked away from the line, but were headed for disaster. Soon after this, they hit a rock, broke the rear suspension, and that was their race run. Bariyawa, still on a high after the birth of his second child just three days ago, was driving like a man possessed. Rousseau had to hold on for dear life. With comrades marathon runner Nick Harper and stand-in nav Andrew Chalupski in the turquoise Atlas Copco bat in third, chasing dust. Fassad Mardenost followed next. Their Hilux was looking and sounding great. As for Matthews and Smith, they weren't exactly holding back either. Let's go in car. Well, they weren't exactly, and for a reason, the Century Property back was being boldly pursued. 
Cox, with former national champion Henny Testeja at his side, was quick, but according to Alfie, not quite quick enough in the motorite SP. But this man, Anthony Taylor, certainly was. Bush or no Bush? And that's not an American political junk, I can assure you. Yeah, that's what you call hell for leather driving. As for the Sulbalts, Father Cully and son Quinton, they were doing the same thing. Krobler, the veteran of track, Randy and off-road has not had a very pleasing season. One win and a lot of battling, but he was back in the thick of things here on day three in the Navarra. Whitehouse and Carlson in the Regent Racing Bat were super steady and got quicker as the day wore on. But the thick Kalahari desert sand made it a test of upper body strength, power steering notwithstanding. At the Marshall Point, Marsh and Grunewald were quick and effective. With the Barkhazens going quickly in the Bloemfontein-based Ruhrkon Toyota, they were up from 15th place and mowing down the opposition. Their stablemates in the Ruhrkon bat, the Whites were also gliding along early on, leading Class P quite handsomely. With Brzezadenate and Debrain setting the pace in Class B. Brain and Brits trying to chase them down in the second place. Swanepoel and Sullivan had made a giant stride or two in the SB class and were finally up into the top seven after starting quickly. And Fontonda and Guapa had the bit between their teeth too. The Ford loved them loose sand. Class D, the front runners, the Zomatans, had extended their lead over the Raysonics boys. But in this sport, like all the others, a never-say-die attitude is vital, and Lovaskakni and Gerbe were far from hoisting the white flag. Peckham and Santoro were flying the Ford flag with style in Class E, and still leading, but unfortunately for them, not for long. because these gents were bearing down on them, Fissa and LaRue, in a spirited mood in the team Barberspan Toyota. With the brothers beside note in the Adenko back in second position in Class P. And back to Class D, where Duploy and Von Furen were up into the top three after coming from 48th overall after the prologue. With Van Bredan de Toy pushing the envelope in Class E for a podium finish. That's right, Arnie, and they were pushing because the Bezada notes were right on their tails. No quarter asked or given, but up ahead and setting the pace after the first hour of racing, it was the Castel Theater of Cronier and Birken. The young Rudiport driver had pulled ahead to a 1 minute and 46 second gap. But the rest had certainly not given up the chase. Only 20 minutes separated the first seven teams. the specials it was Variyawa and Rousseau who had stormed into the lead after the Rapsa bat had succumbed to the desert's harder objects after just 30 k's. Here only 20 odd minutes covered the top 10. It was hard racing. Foss and Weichelt in the Nissen then made a big push and Grandier let him go past. and the man wearing number SP6 was content to let Foss find the way, but it meant that the Castrol Toyota crew were on a dust diet. Woolridge and Schulthammer were biding their time in the Ford Ranger, but lost some time due to a puncture. Mm. 
they weren't exactly having a lot of luck with the stuff on the wheels. And in the special vehicle class, Voriawa, who has been hunting for a win here for 15 years, was perfectly set to clinch the deal, but there was still a long way to go. As our camera tracked back, we found Krobler and more in the second Nissan chasing as only the burly man can. After all, he first won this one way back in 1984. Harper and Chilovsky came by next, getting every ounce of power out of the Atlas Copco bat six liters. And ditto for Colin Matthews and Alan Smith in the Century Property Developments bat, who were a model of consistency. Michael Whitehouse and Matthew Carlson were rock steady in the region racing bat, but were battling overheating problems. Choking in their dust, it was Taylor and Halton in the second Hilux. The manufacturer's battle was on too, as matters stood, only 10 points separated Nissan from Toyota and Ford, and all three manufacturers were hell-bent on solid performances in the three classes. And now back to the specials, where the Silvolts, defending champions, were enjoying their new bat, but also overheating. But Mr. Cool, Alfie Cox wasn't having any troubles, at least nothing major, just one puncture. The 23-time national champ was enjoying his desert joyride. Enjoying his desert joyride. Well, that's stretching the truth a little, honey. But anyway, for Terence Marsh and Peter Krunewald, a steady desert approach was working well. But then Cox ran into grief. We've got an electrical problem. Uh, we've got no battery power, and I think the alternator stopped working. So obviously without the alternator, it ain't going anywhere. So I don't know if we can find something to get it going. Just to the service point, we've only got 17 Ks to go to the service. So. But it was a great day today. I mean, we've come up right behind Nardis. I think that was fourth on the road and uh, then all the trouble started so we've had our fair share but this is the desert race you get dealt one day you're up and the next day you're down and uh, unfortunately we need a bit better preparation and uh, hopefully we'll well, it's good to see you near the front again isn't it? yeah i know it was having a great race yeah, yeah. anyway a philosophical cox but no time for that for the ruacon team of george and sharon barkhausen up into the top 10 and flying along and Bez Bezadenote and Johanna Brain were comfortably setting the pace in the B-Class. In fact, they had more than half an hour to play with. Henry and Maurice Matten appeared next into the top ten for the first time in the production car class. And right on their tails, it was P-Class leaders, brothers Johan and Etienne Bezadenote. Barberspun SP pilot Chris Fasani's co Yapi Bardnost, it was the end of the desert road. Yeah, we. Uh, we were sitting behind Nick Harper the whole morning and uh, like maybe 20 kilometers and uh, it was like a swerve in the road and I was a little bit too quick. The buck is back in to the left and it was a small tree on the left hand side and took the tree and it actually broke the, the shocks at the back and the tram rods at the bottom that was holding the axle in place that broke off and the bucky slided and we were like <coughs> we, the bucky was this yes, was in there so just try to get out and get the guy not to keep on us so uh, i mean we just fix it to come out uh, unfortunately it's very very unfortunate disappointment doesn't have a nice taste does it